after that. <laughs> but like I said, there's an email list going around. So make sure you put your email on there. I'll just email you the PDF of the, of the workbook. And even if you have a workbook, maybe you want the PDF of it. All right? Um, if you look at page two of your workbook, and I try to follow along the workbook. Um, if you have questions, please ask me. Just raise your hand or whatever, yell out. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is try to just get an overview of what QuickBooks is about. How many of you use QuickBooks right now? Okay. How many of you are running your own business? Good. Okay. So some of this may be redundant because we're going to go through creating a company. But even I have found that people who are currently in QuickBooks and using it have never really explored the preferences. So looking at the preferences shows you what goes on behind the keys. And we'll spend a little bit of time looking at that. All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, look at page three. Notice when you first come up, if you don't have a company file open, you'll see the last companies you had open, as well as the ability to create a new company or open a sample company. A sample company is a nice sandbox that you can use if you want to test to see how a transaction works instead of doing it in your own set of books. So we're going to work a little bit with a sample company. I'm going to open up the product-based business. Now the other thing I'm going to do is I'm using QuickBooks Accountant, um, which allows me to get clients' books via email and do adjusting entries and send it back. So I'm going to toggle this. <clears throat> Most of you would be, you know, you, you can use QuickBooks Pro. It's the cheapest edition. Is anybody using the online? I hate it. I hate it. I'll tell you why. A couple of reasons. Number one, I can't have 15 windows open simultaneously because I like to have a lot of windows open. So I want to look at this report and then I got to go close it and go open another report. That's just the nature of an internet browser. The other thing is, the IRS, when they do an audit, request copies of your QuickBooks. Well, you are not able to get a QuickBooks online file down to a hard file. I've, I tried it. It does not come down with the entries correct. <coughs> so I'm not a fan of it. Excuse me, put your mic a little closer. <coughs> as soon as I stop coughing fed here. Excuse me. I think so. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm going to have this coughing fit. All right. First, we'll go over getting around in QuickBooks. That'll be different for online. Um, what you see here is, oh, <coughs> I took to a sinus pill and it's not even working. <coughs> um, what you see here is the home page. I always like to show people, if I close this, you ever have that close? Then you're like, where is it? Click home. Comes back up. Why do I go over this? Is because if you need help, I hate that thing up there. If you need help, 
you need to know what the software calls it. So if I'm going to go over here to the help and try to find an answer to something, we need to know what is the software calling it. So most of us are familiar that this is the menu, the main menu. These are the submenus. Here's the icon bar. Now, when you open QuickBooks, yours probably looks like this. Does it look like that? I'm not crazy about that because I like the whole screen. So if you don't like what you see, you go to view. And then I would say top icon bar. And look, it gives me a whole lot more room on the desktop. They started doing this, I think, in 15, um, where they would put that bar to the side. And I was like, why do you do that? That's so annoying. You just took up a quarter of my screen. So I just wanted to make sure you see how to do that. Page six talks about using forms. Now, I just updated the text last week, so to 16. And I tried to put in a little more pointers. When you look at using forms, you see the little icon? If you have multiple windows open, and you may not know, you have so many things you can't find it, you can go to this window, and it'll show you down here what's open. So you can touch it and activate it. You're going to use forms to enter your data, which is what I recommend. So if I were to open, I think I showed you here, it's not a very good copy, the right checks window. Notice I've given you the components of that window. This is your title bar. It will always tell you the window you have open, and then your fields. And then here's your line item area down here. Notice there are two tabs in the line item area. Expenses, under right checks, is where you would do normal things that don't interact with inventory. If you wanted to interact with inventory, you need to use the items tab. All right? So that's the difference between the two. Any questions? Yes? What if you're a service business and you don't have inventory? Or you never need to use that. So I never use that. Mm -hmm. Centers focus your activity to certain functional areas, such as customers, vendors, employees. So if I were to open a center, I can do it here the customer center, or I can do it here, opens the customer center. This is where I will see you know, all my customers. If I'm on the customers and jobs tab, always notice there's like two tabs here. The other tab is transactions. Now the reason why you, it's set up this way is let's say you know a customer and you want to see a transaction on their account. Then you use this tab. Select the customer. Look over to the right. You can filter your transactions. This one says all transactions this fiscal year. You can toggle it to a specific date. So if I know the customer, this is the way I want to go in. And what if I don't know the customer? What if instead I'm looking for the transaction and I can't remember who it was to? I remember I did this invoice last week. Who did I do that to? I'm going to go to the transactions tab. Here, again, we can filter. These are estimates. Here's invoices. I can go to a specific date. I can say all today, last week. So now you can drill down to locate that invoice. Once you do, 
you can always double click to open it. Have any of you used the customer center? Yes? This is also where you can manage your customers. You can edit them, add new ones, all right? Delete them. You can't delete them if there's a transaction history. You can inactivate them, and then they'll no longer pop up. You can also initiate transactions here, but I think it's much easier to do that from the home page. Any questions on the customer center? If I go to vendors, I, you know, the vendor centers set up the same way. I don't really cover employees or payroll in this course, and I'll tell you why later, but I don't recommend small businesses doing their own payroll. And I'll give you reasons why in a little bit. Page 8 talks about registers. I don't think you should use them. The reason is it's not as easy to enter the data. So if I were to click on checking, this is a register. You can actually make entries right into this. But again, it's not as easy. You don't have a form. It doesn't help guide you. You can also open up a transaction from here. All right, now we're going to talk about on page 9. <clears throat> All the accounting you need to know. You're like, yeah, I love accounting. I do love accounting. <laughs> All right, so your chart of accounts, and I'll bring that up. This is the chart of accounts. Now, how did I bring that up? <laughs> Control A, or it's always under list. The list menu allows you to open up inventory items, your accounts, payroll items, sales tax items. So those are in lists. So this is really the foundation for all your accounting transactions. Accounting is double entry, debit, credit. A lot of times in QuickBooks, you don't even have to worry about that. All you need to do is fill out the form correctly, which is why I say use forms. <clears throat> and QuickBooks post it behind the keys. It makes the debit and the credit. When you're looking at this chart of accounts, you're looking at assets, liabilities, equity, income, and expense. All right, so I've got you the picture on page 9. This type, that field right there, and if I open up this account, i got to go right-click. Right-click is always your best friend. Edit account. Do you see the type? The type tells QuickBooks where it goes, where it goes on the financial statement. So I've gotten, I've received clients' books before, and I'll see fixed asset, and it's on the profit and loss. And why is it on the profit and loss? Because they gave it an expense type. But it's an asset. So, you know, this thing's not a genius. It can't read. It has to know by fields where things go. So that's why I tell you on page 9 that that account type is very important. So on page 10, I show you this account here. Notice that there is an account number here. Now, the thing that utterly fascinates me about QuickBooks 
is the sample company comes with every account numbered. However, yours won't be. Because by default, they don't number the accounts. They don't turn that on. Accountants like to see your general ledger accounts numbered. First of all, it'll sort it in numeric numerical order. At the top of page 10, I give you the framework for numbering your accounts. Assets should begin with a 1. These are all assets they have here with the 1s. All right? Liabilities start with a 2. Equity accounts with a 3. 4 is income. 5 is cost of goods sold. 6, 7, 8, 9, expenses, whatever. All right? So I've given you that at the top of page 10. <clears throat> Most of us are familiar with what assets are. You know, it's the things that we own. It's our bank accounts, any receivables, any inventory, liabilities. I know we all know what those are, right? It's what we owe. Our payables, our credit cards, any loans. Equity. That's always a tough one for people to understand. How many of you operate as an LLC? Mm -hmm. How many is a sole proprietorship? Okay. People always go, I'm going to pay myself in an LLC or a sole proprietorship. No, you don't. There's no such thing as W-2 wages in an LLC, unless you've elected to be treated as a corporation, or a sole proprietorship. You will be taxed on 100% of your profit. So it doesn't matter if you take money out or you don't take money. You're taxed on all of it. Now, I wish that the service would change this because you have to realize I see a lot of people, and generally they're small businesses, with tax problems. And why? They aren't making estimated payments. So it comes up, they go to the tax person, they do the return, they say, yo, 12000 like, where am I getting that at? Right? I wish LLCs did receive wages the members. The problem is you're under partnership tax law and there's no such thing as W-2s for partners. All right, so you need to make sure you're making those estimated tax payments. That's where your equity account comes in. Whenever you take money out personally, it goes against your equity. That's the 300, the, the accounts will start with three. This one, this company happens to be set up as a corporation. How do I know that? I look at the equity accounts. That's another thing that an accountant does. Of course, we don't rely solely on that. Here we have capital stock, shareholder distributions, and retained earnings. If you're an LLC, you're going to have member equity, member draws, that's when you take money out. When you put money in, it's member contributions. All the transactions that interact with you go through the three the, the accounts that start with three, the equity accounts. All right? Any questions? Yes? Is that a positive or a negative If you take it out, it'll show up as a negative number in equity. If you put money in, it'll show up as a positive number. But you don't have to worry. You're going to make a journal entry, and I'm going to show you all about journal entries. Um, it'll do it, yeah. What about for nonprofits? You're, you're different. First of all, there's no, there shouldn't be any interaction with you. Right. So you've kind of got fund accounting. So those are fund balances. You know, designated funds, unrestricted funds, those kind of things. 
Any other question? No? Now, equity ends up being, in accounting terms, assets minus liabilities. Because when we look at a balance sheet, it has to balance. That's why it's called balance sheet. But you've got your assets at the top, and we'll see one here in a few minutes. You've got your liabilities down below, and the difference between the two is your equity, and what that means is it's whatever income or profit you've made over time, as well as any contributions or distributions that you've made over time. Look at page 12. And this talks about the profit and loss. Now, the thing I love about accounting and the law and insurance, you can name it, we call the same thing 15 different things, right? I remember when I was first sitting in my first accounting class and I was like, what are they talking about? You know, that's a capital transaction. I'm thinking, okay, what's capital? To me, that's an asset. But no, they were talking about the capital accounts, which are your equity accounts, all right? QuickBooks calls an income statement a profit and loss. <clears throat> so you can hear it called P&L, income statement, profit and loss. So just realize when you're looking for that in QuickBooks, it's a profit and loss. And what gets placed on there are the income and the expense accounts. All right? Page 13. Very, very, very important. There are two bases of accounting. Actually, there can be a third, but for your purpose, cash or accrual. Now, the IRS says if you're a certain size, you have you know, 10 million or more in income, or you have so much in, in inventory, you have to be accrual. I can guarantee you if the service says you have to be something, you do not want to be that. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Why do I not want to be that? Because under the accrual basis, you are taxed as soon as you do an invoice. That is income. As soon as the invoice goes out. Well, you don't collect it for six months. You don't have the cash in your pocket. But you're going to pay tax on it. It also says, as soon as you get a bill, it's an expense. That's the accrual basis. The cash basis is very simple. And at one point, they were talking about, we're going to make everybody go to the accrual basis. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm lucky if my clients can even do accounting. Let alone, you're going to make them do accrual, which is very difficult. Trust me. You have to look at cutoff dates, get the bills in, get all the invoices in. For you, you want to be a cash basis, which means if it gets deposited in the bank, it's income. And if you've sent the check out it's an expense. If you paid for it on a credit card, it's an expense. That's what I find most businesses miss. Most of us, our credit cards cut off in the middle of the month. They don't cut off at the end of the month. So think about it. January statement has December expenses on it. Do you ever think about that? No. As soon as you charge it, you have a liability, so you get to expense it. All right, just it's the same if you went and borrowed money to purchase something. How do you tell the IRS what basis you're using? What basis you're taxed on? Does anybody know how you tell them? No, they don't ask you. I waited two hours to talk to somebody at the IRS today. Two 
hours. Oh yeah, we either need to abolish them or give them money. Anybody have a question? Anybody know? You file your tax return. The first time you file your tax return, there's a little question. Cash or accrual? Now, <clears throat> if you've marked accrual accidentally, it's easy to change. Used to not be in the old days. Used to you had to go ask the IRS for permission. But there is a way, and you should see an accountant who would then be able to take you to cash basis. But it is that first return that you file that you make that election. Any questions? Yes. Talking about when I was 16 and, and had a job and made 500 bucks, and now I'm hopefully making more. I made my decision when I was 16, and it stayed with me for 40 years, some years. Mm -hmm. I can't change it. Further. You can't go back. But you can change it going forward. Good question. Going forward. Now, I'm going to open up a report because I always love it because I say to my clients, send me your uh, P&L because they want to ask you questions like you know exactly what's in their stuff. I don't know until you send it to me, right? <laughs> so I'll say, send me a profit and loss. A lot of times you need the accrual basis turned on because you're, you've got receivables and you want to go look at those things, all right? I'm going to go to company and run a profit and loss. And I'll run it for this fiscal year. And I'll make it smaller so I can get to the bottom of it. But notice what that says there. See it right there? I pointed that out to you on page 13. Got to look there. Tells you what basis you're reporting this on. I'm going to scroll down to the bottom. On the accrual basis, the taxable income is 114000 roughly. I'm now going to customize this report. I click Customize Report. And I'm going to turn it to the cash basis. Oh, 61000 huh? I'd rather pay tax on that. Right? So always look at that. There's times you may want to look at it on the accrual basis because that'll have your receivables in there and your payables. But for taxes, you want it on the cash basis. Okay? So I've shown you on page uh, 14. I talk about the financial statements that you should look at. Yes? Doesn't it sort of all come out in the wash in a sort of a rolling 12 months? No, not necessarily. Do you ever have bad debt? Do you ever have people not pay you? Oh, you're lucky. The other thing, too, is I want you to understand. A cash basis taxpayer does not have a deduction for bad debt. No. Why? Bad debt is for people on the accrual basis. They recognize the income when it was invoiced. Therefore, if it never gets paid, they get to take a deduction. Cash basis people didn't do that. You only recognize when it's paid. So you never have bad debt expense. All right? Um, so here's your P&L, your profit and loss. Then you've got your balance sheet. Again, this is on the accrual basis, so I'll flip this to the cash basis. Because I want you to see the articulation between the two statements. A profit and loss reports over a period of time. Whereas a balance sheet is a picture on a day. So 
So I need to make it the same day. And when I scroll down, the income here, 61619, is over here under my equity. All right? <clears throat> now, retained earnings is your income or loss over time, and then this is your current year income. All right, any question? That's how it balances. It takes whatever entries were on, really whatever entries were on the income and expense accounts and pulls it over onto the balance sheet to make it balance. One final statement is a statement of cash flows. This takes your income all right, this is being reported on a cruel basis. It takes the income and makes adjustments for cash. So accounts receivable went down, or I'm sorry, went up, so it deducts that from your income. Because remember, it's adjusting income back to cash. It's really pulling over the cash effect that went on on your balance sheet. Because remember, balance sheet's not reported on your income statement. So it's taking the income statement number and, if, and giving it the cash effect for transactions that occurred for the period on your balance sheet. Why do people care? Well, statement of cash flow is pretty important. Because if you're not generating cash from operations, you got problems. Uh, cash from operations means your day-to-day -day activities, buying and selling your product or delivering your services, paying your expenses. That's your operating. If you're not generating cash on an operating basis, then you're getting it from probably borrowing, credit card debt, loans, so it's important to monitor your cash flow. And that's what the statement of cash flows does. Any questions? Yes? If it generates revenue, then if you're on a cash basis, wouldn't you get paid? And if so, how do you account for your receivables? You still have them in here. They're still in there. It's just that when you report on your tax return, you want to, do it, you want to use the cash basis one. The accrual basis looks at the, the receivables. You've got that ability to toggle it back and forth. I just want you to be aware that when you're doing your return, you want to use the cash basis. All right. Any other questions? Page 15 explains the importance of backing up your data. You know what's nice? Anybody ever worked for a company? Yeah, you forgot your password, you called somebody, right? You needed something fixed, you called your tech department. Well, you're a small business, you're everything. So you have to be the one who backs up your data. And it's important, and it's a good thing QuickBooks will remind you that, unless you're online. I also recommend you do an archive backup when you're done with a tax year. And the reason is, I told you, the IRS wants those files. And why do I want to give them, they're looking at 13, why do I want to give them 14, 15, 16? I don't want to give them that. So I do a backup of my 14 data and keep that as an archive backup file. Same every year. Now, if you're ever in that situation, if you see an accountant who has QuickBooks accounting, like the accountant version, we can strip out all the years. I've done that before. Strip out the year before, the year after. 
Remember, if you're being audited, don't volunteer. Make them ask. You're always honest. You give them whatever they ask for and nothing else. If they're looking at 13, they don't need to be looking at 15 or 14 unless they find an issue with 13. And then they have to do another request to open up that tax year. All right? The other thing, too, is oftentimes when you back up, you're backing it up to your local machine, right? Well, what happens if the machine catches on fire or you lose it? I use Carbonite. Anybody ever heard of it? It's online, real time, backs up your system. So I think it's only like 60 bucks a year. It's worth it. Any questions before we get out of lesson one? Yes? Yeah, but you know, whenever you're dealing with QuickBooks, there's always another fee. I mean, you need to back up more than QuickBooks on your machine. That's why I say Carbonite, because it backs up everything on your computer. All your Word documents, anything. Any other, was there another question? Yes? Yeah. Do you take the external hard drive home with you? Well, my home is my office. So okay. Do you take it somewhere where your house catches on fire? No. Then it's not going to help you. You see what I'm saying? That's disaster recovery. They learned when the World Trade Center went down what happens with disaster recovery. And disaster recovery procedures were drastically changed. There are now hot spots, Chicago, different places, where they're replicating the data. They had off-site storage, but the off-site storage got hit. So. It's important that you think about every type of peril that could occur. Any questions? Okay, let's look now at chapter two. I exited. Genius. Um, let's just open this for a minute. Because I have to always toggle back to QuickBooks Pro. <laughs> We're going to go through here. Um, this lesson is going to really deal with setting up a new company, but that's what we're going to talk about. Um, some legal aspects. There's now a, uh, <laughs> a Supreme Court opinion that says, I must tell you that whenever I tell you something about legal aspects, I am not giving you a legal opinion. Okay, you are not my client. So much easier to be an accountant, trust me. Um, so I'm now going to create a new company. Page 19, I always say just do the express start, it's the easiest. And I've tried to give you illustrations, but a lot of you have already set your company up. You have to enter anything that has an asterisk required. So I'm going to say test two, because I think I've already used test. <laughs> Industry, help me choose. Well, what does that do for me? It really just, first of all, Intuit is the master of sales. They love to sell you things. You always kind of say, do you need checks? You ever get that? Well, they also have called tax software. 
So whenever you select one of these business types, it maps your accounts to the tax software, like if you were going to use their tax software. But the other thing it does is it gives you a certain framework of general ledger accounts. Very minimal, but it does do that. So I'm going to do a general product-based business. You know, see, if I hit service-based, you don't see cost of goods sold. I know it's hard to see that, but then if I hit this, you can see cost of goods sold. So you see, it will give you different types of base accounts. You're still going to have to do work on setting up your accounts. Mm -hmm. So if you do services and products? Then you'd want to do the general product-based business. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Yes? So if you start out with professional services firm, but you offer workbooks or, you know, something, Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll, we're going to go through preferences, and you're going to see we can turn on any feature. This is just to save you, hopefully, time in creating a bunch of a chart of accounts. Business type. Again, it interacts with their tax software. <coughs> um, if you are a sole proprietorship, you file on a Schedule C on your Form 1040, right? If you are a Single member LLC, the IRS says you're disregarded, you are a disregarded entity. That means your tax form still goes on your Form 1040, Schedule C. The reason for this is when attorneys created LLCs, limited liability companies, Thank God Congress didn't say, let's go write a whole new section of the tax code. Instead, they said, where are we going to put these things? And they decided, if you're one member, you're the same as a sole proprietor. Now, do not get confused. Legally, you are a separate entity. Legally. There's always two aspects. How does the law see me? And how does the government see me? The IRS. So that's where people will get confused. You are still a separate legal entity. It's just the service says we don't recognize that for taxes. Yes? Is that true even if the EIM is open to the single member? Yes, absolutely. And you don't need an EIN. Well, you do for your bank account. But it, it is. It's where they put it on. If you're two or more members in an LLC, you're a partnership, but please don't ever use that term. People will do this. I'll get my partner. I guess not your partner. That's your member. Everything has its own terminology. I was in mediation one time. And the judge looks at this and he goes, what is this thing? People decided to write their own operating agreement. That was interesting. They're an LLC, but they call themselves partners. You don't do that. <coughs> Excuse me. Everything has its own terminology. If you say partner, you're a partnership. We don't want to be that. They're members. Your investments, units, units, membership interest units. That's how the, the law is written. The Ohio Revised Code statute is written that way. If you're a corporation, you're a shareholder. All right? Everything has its own terminology. Yes?
file Yes. You 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 can each file a C separately. Instead of filing a instead of yeah, instead of filing a partnership return, you can do a C separately. And the reason for that is assessing your self employment tax. That's the reason. Plus it gives you the credit on the social security. Did everybody hear her question? If you have your spouse as an owner with you, you file two Schedule C's. You just take your net income split in half, unless there's a separate percentage. All right? So terminology is important. It tells the world what you are. When you get sued, how did you act? I had that. I had a client get sued, and they sued him personally and his business. So, of course, I write a motion to get the client personally removed. Well, guess what? He didn't follow the formalities. The, per the vendor he was interacting with thought it was him, sole proprietorship. You've got to use your name the way it is. There's a reason when you form a business at the Secretary of State site, why I'll say put LLC or LTD with your name or Corp or Inc. with a corporation, you should always use your full name. Always sign member, president, whatever. Tell the world what you are. Don't let someone think they're dealing with you personally. Did you have a question? Is the S Corp the same as in they can choose to do? An S Corp has to file an 1120S. Yes, but I mean, like, um, a husband and wife, it's an one or two, depending on how you One shareholder, but you would do two K1s. When you are a, okay, you can form a corporation at the Secretary of State website, but you cannot form an S corporation at the Secretary of State website. Why? The S corporation is a figment of tax law. It is an, an election you make with the IRS that says, I want to be treated as a small business corporation, which means I, I get passed through income. <clears throat> now, we know in this election, there's a lot of talk about corporate tax rates. And a lot of times, people don't want to be in a corporation. Because let me tell you, at $75,000, you're paying 28% in tax. It kicks up real quick. And you can go to as high as 39% real quick. Quicker than a person. Which is why a lot of times people may form a corporation and elect to be treated as an S. Because then they get to bring that income back on them personally and pay a lower tax rate than the corporation would pay. Say that again? Because they would be able to pass the income. You form a corporation, but then elect to be? You form a corporation with the Secretary of State, and then you file an election, a 2553, with the IRS, and say, I want to be a small business corporation. That's what an S means, small business corporation. Of course, there are certain rules. Have to be U.S. owners, no foreign owners, no corporate owners. Nobody can own it but people, individuals, and they must be U.S. citizens. Yeah, so you can be a single member LLC that elects to be an S corporation. Absolutely. You can be a single member LLC that elects to be treated, taxed as an S Corp. What's the benefit to that? Self-employment tax. The rule says you must pay yourself a reasonable wage. That's where people get in trouble. They'll come to me, I'll go, where's your wages? You're an S Corp. Well, I don't know, I just take the money out. You can't do that. No, they can come back in and recharacterize it. 
Now, what does it mean? Let's say I, I have $50,000 of income, taxable income. But I didn't take all 50000 out. I have to leave it in my business. I need money in the bank. Well, I don't want to pay tax, self-employment tax. That's your Social Security and your Medicare times two because it's your half and it's the employer's half. So I become an S-Corp. And I pass wages to myself. And then I'm not self-employment taxed on all the money I made. I didn't take it all out. Mm -hmm. Nope. Secretary. Got to file 2553 or an 8332 if you're an LLC. Yes, it is a sickness. <laughs> <laughs> if you're a corporation, you'll file 2553 or an 8832. I hope that one's correct because I always get that one confused with the um, allowing your, your, your ex spouse to take the kid as a deduction. They're almost the same numbers. But it is different. If it's an LLC, it's a different form. You can skip to 2553. All right. Any questions? No? Mm -hmm. I guess, who decides what a reasonable wage is? Huh? That's a good question. Who decides what a reasonable wage is? IRS. For many people, that's not so difficult because you can see others. Like if you're a manager of a retail store, and it also is going to be in comparison to how much income, you're not going to pay yourself a wage that's going to create a loss on your books. But, you know, you should pay yourself a little bit higher than a manager would be because you're the owner. But it is a good question. What is a reasonable wage? It's so ambiguous. What do you think a reasonable wage would be for an attorney? Huh? Trust me, you just better take it all as wages. Uh, <laughs> so, uh -huh. so if you're a writer, right? Uh huh. No income coming in, all expenses going down. Uh huh. What do you do? I mean, are you taking losses year after year after year? Well, after so long, after five years, they call it the hobby rule. And they'll say it's not a real business. All right. I remember reading this case one time where an accountant, a CPA, paid himself $40,000 in wages and took $300,000 as distributions out of the S-Corp. <laughs> Come on. Because remember, if I take it as a distribution, I don't pay self-employment tax on it. Whereas if I'm paying it as wages, I'm paying the self-employment tax. All right, any questions on that before I go on? All right, I'm going to make this. And when you select this in here, it also sets up your equity accounts based on what you pick. I'm going to pick single member LLC since most of us are that. If you're doing pay one QuickBooks, again, I don't recommend it. I deal with all the time people who have payroll tax issues. Yeah, you know, we set up a corporation or we set up an LLC and we think we're protected from liability. That is not always the case. Any type of trust fund tax, fiduciary tax, doesn't matter if you're a corporation or an LLC, you will be personally liable for it. That includes sales tax. That includes payroll taxes. All right, so I just say hire ADP or paychecks. They're reasonable, and they'll handle everything for you. I am now going to create the data file. In QuickBooks, you can have multiple data files. So if you have two or three different companies, you don't need two or three different purchases of the software. All right, you can create multiple companies in here. Hey, I'm all set, it says.
All right, now let's look at t page 23. Oh, I forgot to preview the settings. I'm so bad. I'm sorry, guys. When we were in there, there was a tab to preview the settings before you created the data file. And that's illustrated on page 23. Anything in here, we can always change. So when you're going through, don't get hung up. You can always change. We're gonna, I'm gonna, that's what we're going to do next. No, it's okay. It's okay. Page 24. <clears throat> that little illustration didn't come up because I've used the software before, and I told it don't ever bother me with that again. So that's why it didn't come up. But I don't recommend using it anyway. It'll start asking you, do you want to add people, add customers? The problem is, we don't have the chart of accounts set up correctly. We don't have our preferences entered correctly. So that's like the cart before the horse. All right, so that's why I always close that out and do it another way. After I look at the things that need to be fixed. So on page 25, it explains what we need to do to get this data file ready to go. All right, let's look at the company preferences. First, I'm going to change this icon bar to the top. Edit. Oh, hold on. I like to do this first. Notice your basic chart of accounts they give you. Not a whole lot. You've got to enter. They don't even give you a bank account. There's no account numbers, right? So I'm going to go to Edit, Preferences. This controls what goes on behind the keys, how the software processes transactions, how you interact with the software, that's my preferences. That's that tab. So look at page 26. These are the types of preferences over here. The different functional areas, accounting, bills, calendar. All right, so many of you may want to go home and look at this if you're using this because you probably are using the default. There's always on the right side, my preferences and company preferences. The difference. My preferences is to this user on this machine. That's it. This user on this machine. It's a personal preference. Company preferences goes with the data file. Take the data file, take it to another machine, the company preferences stay. So that's the difference between the two. Page 27 shows you how to turn on account numbers. I'm going to minimize this a little bit. See if you. So when I should have it the other way. When I go to accounting and I say use account numbers. And then I touch off that. I've made changes, yes. Notice all those account numbers come. Now, it used the numbering convention I gave you in Chapter 1. One's assets, two's liabilities, three's equity. All right? I'm going to go back to accounting. This says that whenever you do a journal entry, they'll automatically increment it each time, so you don't have to put that number over there if you don't want to. One, when posting a transaction to retained earnings. All right? You shouldn't really be posting to retained earnings unless it's your initial transaction, your initial entries. One, if transactions are 90 days in the past, 
That's important. We can, <coughs> we can close our books. I just clicked set date password. Closing your books is important. It's so easy to accidentally change a transaction in the past. Especially when it's 2017 January and you're still in 16. I've done that. It's like, where did I put that transaction? Now I have to go find it. Okay? So, setting a closing date is important. When you're done with an accounting period, go in here, set the closing date, and then it will warn you if you try to post backwards. The other thing you could do is you could warn, change this to 30 days in the past. But if you've got somebody else working in your QuickBooks besides you, you want to set the closing date and give it a password. Otherwise, they'll just blow past it and make the entry anyway. Because they'll come out and say, you're posting in the closed period. Do you want to go and do that? Yeah. Right? So if you've got somebody who's working in their QuickBooks besides you, setting that password, they would have to enter the password to blow past that. All right? This is the one that's pretty important. Because closing the books doesn't only works with prior transactions. This is the only thing that will warn you if you're going too far in the future. It's so easy to hit a wrong date, a wrong year. So this says, let me know if I'm 30 days in the future. Just pop up and warn me. All right, any questions there? Under my preferences, there really aren't any for this category. All right, so even though the tab's there, there really isn't anything. If we look at bills, more, uh, bills are due 10 days after receipt. You know what? A lot of us don't even use bills. Anybody use bills? You do? Ooh. I don't. I pay things electronically, um, automatically. Bills are really there if it's somebody who's doing a lot of inventory and you want to get the inventory recorded. But you can also do it just as a right check, and we'll see those differences. Um, but if you are doing it, you know, you can set the default here. Warn if you've got a duplicate bill number, you're entering your invoice number. And then automatically use your credits if there's a credit on the account or discounts, all right? Calendar doesn't really have anything. Those are more my preferences. Um, let's go down and look at All right, let's say that you didn't turn on inventory. Remember you said when I went through I didn't have any inventory? You can turn that on here. Inventory and purchase orders are active. What that's going to do is, is put that icon up in this bill area that interacts with inventory. So remember, anything in QuickBooks, you can go back in to the preferences and select that. All right, Warren, if I've got duplicate purchase orders. Now, when I touch off this, it's going to say I have to close the home page. And the reason why it's going to say that is it has to put the little icons out here now for inventory. So I'll touch it off. I'll save it. QuickBooks has to close the windows. <coughs> All right. If you use jobs, if you do estimates, you can turn that feature on. Do you create estimates? Yes, no. All right. An estimate, QuickBooks Pro does not come with sales orders. However, you can use estimates and then turn the estimate into an invoice. All right, so that's a way around it. 
payments. Take a look at this because this determines that when a client pays you money to an invoice, if these are selected, it's going to automatically do certain things. First, it's going to automatically apply the payment. So it's going to pay the, the oldest invoice. So you have to pay attention if you don't want it to do that. If you don't want it to do it all together, just uncheck this feature. Automatically calculate <clears throat> payments. So if you enter the amount, or you go down and automatically check, check, check invoices, it'll automatically calculate the amount at the top of the form, how much you're, you're paid. Undeposited funds. Anybody ever have fun with undeposited funds? <laughs> you would put the deposit, you would put the payment in, then you go look at your bank account and you're like, where's the payment at? So you keep putting it in. <clears throat> I know I put this in. Because it's sitting in this account called undeposited funds waiting for you to make a deposit. Now, why would I want to use this feature? Some of us may not. If you get routinely one big check that's deposited, you don't need undeposited funds. You can just unmark that or go right to your bank account. However, if you're going to have multiple checks go in with a deposit, you need to use this. Because when you go to reconcile your bank statement, you're going to see the deposit amount Good luck figuring out what checks went into that. All right, so that's why you use the undeposited feature. And I'll show it to you how it works. But, you know, if this is turned on, you have to be making those deposits. How many of you reconcile your bank account? Good. I asked my clients, do you reconcile your bank account? No. Your cash basis. Guess what's the most important thing? Your bank account. When you get selected for audit, I will tell you <clears throat> the top things they ask for. Copies of all your bank statements. So please keep copies of them because banks charge a fortune to get them. They force you to get them online. They're going to say, give me the documentation for your travel. And you better have it and have the business purpose on it. They'll say, give me your meals and entertainment receipts. You should say the business purpose on it. Give me your mileage. The mileage log. If you do not have a mileage log, if you do not have your meals and entertainment documented, if you do not have your travel documented, you will get Zero. I don't care. Nothing will you get. There's no such thing as reasonable. I had a guy who was a repo agent, and he traveled around. And he, you know, he went around and repoed company equipment. He got selected for audit because he had a lot of mileage. He went, of course, he didn't have his travel log because... He had a flood, and all of his papers were destroyed. So he got his accountant who died. I said, buddy, you got some bad karma. <laughs> bad karma. So I said, here's what you got to do. Or you're not going to get one penny of this travel. You're going to have to go back to who you work for, get copies of the invoices if you can, and chart the mileage. Of course, he wasn't able to do to identify all of it, but it was better than nothing. Because the statute says you have to document it. So those are the things we're going to ask for. Any questions? Yeah. That's if you take any mileage expense on the tax return. Because they don't care how you did it. Any mileage expense. <clears throat> And use it 100% for business? Yeah. But you have to use it 100% for business. 
And then you wouldn't have mileage on there because the business would be paying for everything. I think you need mileage though to your start of where you're going to work business. I don't think you do it from your home. You're absolutely right. Commuting mileage is personal use. Going to and from work is personal use. You're hired. <laughs> All right? So if you're a shareholder in S-Corp, you can impute back that personal use to your W-2. Otherwise, you'd have to leave the car at the business. All right? So it's important, like I said, to make sure you have those things because those they're always, it's called the low-hanging fruit. They know they're always going to make money off those things because people don't have it. I scan everything in. Shh. I'm not going to keep paper forever. Get a little scanner, scan it in, have it backed up. You ever get audited, here you go. Here's all your little PDF files. You can go look through it. All right, bless you. Reports and graphs. And I've given you a little chart. What I don't illustrate in here, um, I've given you a little chart on page 30 of some other things. If you're somebody that doesn't invoice, you can come in here under reports and graphs and say, I always want my report my reports to go on a cash basis. Right there's the feature. That means every time you open a report, it'll be only on a cash basis. You won't have to mod customize the report and toggle it back and forth. Or if you don't want to see that. All right? Sales tax. Do we pay sales tax? On a cash basis or an accrual basis? Accrual. Doesn't matter what basis of, of accounting you use on your tax return, sales tax is owed when you invoice it. And there's a reason for that if you think about it. This month, sales tax is 6.75. You did a tax increase next month. It's seven. So we're always going to go off when you invoice it. Okay? So I'm going to say, yes, I charge sales tax right there. Then you add your most common sales tax item. So what this is doing when I click this, it is opening up the inventory. I don't want to call it inventory, the item list, because the item list contains more than just inventory items. And then you would pick sales tax item. So I'm going to say it's Summit County. And what is it? Is it 6.75? Yes. I forget. And then who do you pay it to? This will create a vendor on the fly. Ohio, Department of Tax. When I tab off, it says you want to set up this vendor. If I say quick add, it just puts the vendor name, that's it. Whereas if I say set up, it will actually allow you to put more information in here, like the address and everything. But we all have to pay our sales tax online, right? Here's the other thing. I have clients who they get really anxious or setting up a new business. And they go, I'm going to go get my vendor's license. I'm going to go, oh, God, don't do that. If you have a vendor's license, you now have a sales tax reporting obligation. And if you have no sales, you must report zero. Or you're going to get a notice from the Ohio Department of Tax that you owe $2,500 in sales tax. And you're going to freak out. I always know when it's when clients bring me stuff, they go, look at this. 
I go, well, you probably didn't file your sales tax reports because they're always these nice round numbers and they're always shockingly big. <laughs> All right? It's a wake-up call. But let me caution you about sales tax. I had a client get criminally charged for failure to pay sales tax. It's a misdemeanor. He had four counts. We had to go to court. I'd never seen it done before. That seems like, oh, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> um, I'd never seen it done before. I called the prosecutor. He says, what is this? He didn't know. And I said, my client didn't pay a sales tax. He goes, people do that? I go, all the time. <laughs> I have all the time they don't do it. So it is, you can be criminally charged, so even though that's the first time I'd ever seen it, and this guy had never seen it, and he's a prosecutor. Usually what they do is they just send a collection agency after you, and the state of Ohio has 40 years to collect. 40. You cannot bankrupt it. It stays. The IRS has 10 years to collect from the date it's assessed. But stable high is 40, so we're not going to outlive it. And they always put huge penalties. And even if you owe no sales tax, you will get a penalty for failure to file. So there's a penalty for not filing the return. There's a penalty for not paying the return. So once you get that vendor's license, make sure you're always filing your vendor reports. Yes. Yes. And then later on, if you ever write that off, you make it'll be an adjustment. Yes, that's the unfortunate thing. Yes. I have not worked with that add-on. I have a client who does have Nexus in a lot of the states. Does anybody know what that means, Nexus in the states? We'll talk about it in a second. But he actually just has somebody go do it. I know that there's third-party vendors out there that do it. I didn't know QuickBooks was one of them. Or do they have a... a there, there are a lot of guys talking one day called Abstax. Ab yes. Yes. Okay. And CC, no, no, and CCH does it, but no, you have to realize, guys, we're, a lot of us are going to be involved in possibly Nexus in other states. And we're trying, they're trying to pass the uniform sales tax law at the federal level, although they can't pass anything. Um, so they would say that, you know, we're going to have to do the collection a certain way. Because the problem is the burden it puts on people. And believe me, I went through and set up this client's tax accounts. You got to try Louisiana. Uh, First of all, nobody answers a telephone down there. It's like they only work like this small window. Um, and then you sometimes have to get a parish. Arizona. Pennsylvania has the most taxing districts in the whole country. But if you're selling... For the most part, if you're selling on the internet and you're selling out of state, how it stands right now for you as a small business is you're only going to have to collect from Ohio. However, that can end up changing. Where the real problem comes is if you have subcontractors in other states, you now have nexus with that state. Even though they're not your employee, the state says, you've got someone in here. You're availing yourself of our services. You must collect our sales tax. Or if you have, like, Amazon distribution centers. Or they like to also get you if you're trucking stuff into a state with company trucks. So you want to be aware of that. But as right now, most small businesses, it's real easy. We only do Ohio. 
because we're just sending stuff through general carrier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it shouldn't be. You don't do the sales tax on the delivery. Yeah. Right, right. You're not supposed to do that. Okay. All right, any questions on sales tax? I'm always, I always like to point them out because, as I said, I see a lot of people with sales tax issues. And sometimes, let's say you move. The state doesn't know you moved, you get your notice, it doesn't come to you because you're at a new address. They only have to send it to the last known address. And then somewhere like five years down the road, you get a collection agency. And what happens is it goes to the attorney general and they generally hire a law firm. And some of them are nice and some of them are not very nice. You have 50000 they go, we want that in 12 months. I go, dream on. It's not going to happen, right? <laughs> okay. Um, 1099. It's going to make all my existing customers. Because I made a change here, it's going to make all existing customers. I don't have any right now, so it doesn't matter. This will generate your 1099s. On your tax return, it asks you... Did you, were you required to file any 1099s and did you file them? So this will, this will track it for you as long as when we set up a vendor, and I'll show you how to do that, you mark them as a 1099 vendor. And then it will know anybody who got 600 or more and, gen, and print those for you. All right? No, employees are never 1099 vendors. Even though they get paid as a 1099 risk? Then don't call them employees. They're contractors. Yeah. They're contractors. I only want to say that because I have that. My clients say it all the time. My employee, I said, oh my God, if you ever said that, and the IRS is there, you now have employment tax that you have to pay for all those years to those people. If they're contractors, Subcontractors, call them that, my subs. But yeah, you can set that up to where they have those 1099 vendors. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the littlest things can create huge problems. All right? First of all, if you have a doubt as to whether or not someone is a subcontractor versus an employee, Go to the IRS website, self-employed people, there's a checklist. It's not all-inclusive, but it can keep you out of some trouble because the service can come back and say, you owe all this person's withholdings you should have taken out in their Social Security plus the payroll tax you should have done. Then you're going to open up the Ohio Department of Tax. You're going to create a nightmare. So make sure you're properly categorizing your people. Um, and then get, get W-9s on them. I always love when clients, uh, and you can get that on the IRS website. I love when clients want to have these 1099s and then they don't have the person's social number to give it out. Why'd you give them a check? You need to have that. Okay, so you want to make sure you get those things. No, you're gonna to have to key it in. All right. Mm -hmm. No, it won't do that. You'd have to do those yourself. This is only 1099 miscellaneous. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, there is. Now, 
I'll show you that. Please remind me, okay? There is a way to pay it. Any other questions? Yes. Is there any requirement that you do your due diligence to verify that's a person subject to or independent contractor? No. They fill out a W-9. I always want to say I-9. I-9 is an employee. They fill out a W-9 and put the, uh, yeah, their social number and sign it. They sign it and certify it. Yes. Yeah, we'll see when you check that box, yes. The one thing, though, there is a requirement. In the next year, if you pay that person again, there's a backup withholding of 20%. You'd have to send the IRS 20% of their check till they gave you the right social number. If the following year, because IRS will notify you and say, this social number does not match this person. If that person is still working for you, or works again, you have to withhold 20% of their paycheck and send it in. Or not paycheck, their check. That's called backup withholding until they rectify the situation and give you the correct number. All right? Any other questions? All right, let's look at customizing the chart of accounts. I'll put my home page back up here. So when I have my chart of accounts, right now I don't have a bank account. So I go down here to account new, or you can hit control N. And this is where you choose that very important column I told you about, the type. So I'm going to create a bank account. I'll pick this. There are other account types down here. So if you don't see it on that initial page there, look at the drop down. All right? You can only have one accounts receivable account, one inventory, and one accounts payable. That's it. So you'd have to call it an other receivable or other current asset, really. Other current asset or other asset if it's a different kind of accounts receivable. You're only allowed to have one in QuickBooks. One that has this account type. Okay. All right, I'm going to create. Hmm, I was going to say First Merit, but they're not around anymore. Huntington. I got to give her an account number, right? Because I said require account number. So what would I start this with? One. One. It's an asset. And usually I like my bank accounts to come first. So I start them like maybe one, one, two, three, four. And then if you have to do another one, save and close. Or else, or save and new, save and close. You see where you have the ability I thought you had, they used to have the ability to enter, oh, enter opening balances. Don't do it this way. It's too much work. <laughs> I'm all about keep it simple. So you just do a journal entry, and I'll show you how to do that in a little bit. See? Ooh, set up a bank feed? No. All right, so now I have my bank account. And you would go through and add them as you needed them. You can also modify them. Right click, edit the account. You can delete them unless there's transaction history. If there's transaction history and you don't want to see it anymore, right click, make it inactive. All right? Oops. Page 35, I give you the example to enter an opening balance. Once you have all your accounts in here, I just go do a journal entry. Company, make journal entries.
Now don't enter your accounts receivable, your accounts payable, or your inventory. Because those should be entered through those systems. If you want to enter accounts receivable, enter the old invoices you have. Why? How are you going to do the aging? You got to age the accounts. You want to know, you know, you want to know how old that invoice was. The other thing is to enter accounts receivable in a journal entry, you have to pick the customer. Well, you're only allowed to pick one. So you don't enter those in a journal entry. You don't enter your payables if you have any accounts payable, and you don't enter your inventory. So I've given you an example here where the owner has the checking account and they're depositing, they deposited 3000 of their money. So you could say beginning balance. And then they also contributed some furniture and equipment. There's a drop down arrow there. Is there a reason you aren't using it? I like to type it. Yeah, you can use it. Because it, it's, it's hypertext sensitive, so if I start typing F-U-R, it comes up. But you can use it. Um, I'm not coordinated to go back and forth between the mouse and the keyboard, <laughs> generally. All right, so now these are things that the owner contributed. So you want to put that into the equity account. Here I've got retained earnings. It was a corporation, but remember I set us up a sole proprietorship. Oh, where are we? So member equity. You contributed this. That member equity is important. If you have a loss in your business, the IRS says you can only deduct the loss up to the point that you have basis. Basis is that equity. Plus, if you have credit card debt in your own name, all right, or you guaranteed it, that's also basis. But it won't let you. You have to defer the loss to future periods. So it's important that you track what you're putting in there. Notice now, it balanced this. You shouldn't have to use journal entries that often. You know, if you have an accountant do your returns, they'll oftentimes put the um, fixed asset, the depreciation in for you from the tax return. But you shouldn't have to do a lot of journal entries. Yes? If you make a mistake on a journal entry, can you go back and change the amount? Yes. You can go back and edit the transaction. Now, the other thing I want you to realize, <laughs> See, it's warning me I'm putting it to a retained earnings that time I want to do it. Is this this thing under reports? Um, accountant and taxes. You see that audit trail? See, that's another reason why the IRS wants your books. Because that audit trail says everything you did in the software. So if you get an audit notice, please don't go into your QuickBooks and make a bunch of changes. <laughs> right? Because <laughs> it knows you did it. <coughs> all right. Any question? <laughs> I'm trying to give you all the pointers. All right. Let's look at page 36. So every change you make, it's in. It knows everything that happened. But they don't care if they see it in the past because people correct their entries all the time. But if you have an audit notice, you're going to go, no, fix all this up and delete this one. And <laughs> wouldn't look good. Um, all right, com customers. So if I open my customer center and I add a new customer, you know, here's the name um, ABC Rental. You could enter the opening balance here. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. I want to go back to something that you said about not entering things. Sorry. <laughs> if there's an impending audit or something. 
they'll make a lot of changes, like go in and delete. And what if I get into 2017 mm -hmm. and I'm Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can do that. Right, but you wouldn't do that if you got an audit notice. Right. I'm saying once you get the audit notice, don't go in here making a bunch of changes to your QuickBooks file. Saying, oh, I'm in trouble. All right? What using QuickBooks shows the IRS is that you are acting as a responsible business and taking it serious as to, you know, tracking your income expenses as the law requires. So therefore, if there are problems, something comes up, they take that into consideration on the penalty they assess you. It shows you that you are a responsible taxpayer making good effort. All right, so as I said, you can enter the opening balance here, but you're not going to have the aging. You're not going to know exactly what invoices. You're not going to know, you know, how old they are. So, you know, you can do it this way right here, or you can actually go enter your invoices. And then you hit all the contact information here. Payment settings, you know, credit limit. If you set a credit limit, then the next time you go to invoice a client, a customer, if that invoice will cause them to exceed their credit limit, QuickBooks will warn you. So it's a good way to manage your receivables. If you put email, you can email your invoices out of QuickBooks. Payment terms. 110 net 30, you know, if you give them a 1% discount, if they pay you within 10 days, it's a way to speed up your cash flow for good customers. I know you can store credit card information in here. I'm not a fan of that. There's a breach. The red flag rules say you must offer them a year of credit protection, and you must get them. Immediately notify them. I mean, I'm just not a fan. How many have a password on your QuickBooks file? Okay. Because if you've got social numbers and stuff in there, you need to have a password. You should probably change it often. I think new QuickBooks, the new edition, requires you to do it constantly. Like every 60 days or something. I was in the auto industry for a long time, and the social security number brought the question up. We had password, we had to have a locked office door. Yeah. Is that the same with now, because we have social security numbers of our clients? I, I would be, I mean, I take it very serious. You know, my, my constant fear is a breach. Yeah. Because they target attorneys and accountants now. Our systems are targeted. And it can cause a horrible nightmare for your client. If I can go way back to the carbonate, aren't you afraid of the carbonate going to be impacted? No, because it has a... Encryption. It ha it's it's one of the ones that are very high rated. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't like me, does it? Here's the sales tax settings. Um, these are the default settings. So you can change them during entry. And Wednesday night, we're going to go through the very confusing, it seems like they circle around all those sales tax fields on the invoice. You ever notice those? What do they do? All right, so we'll go through those. But this is the default for your client. If it was a church, you would make it non-tax, a government agency non-tax. This is just any type of additional reporting you might want to do. Maybe you have wholesale customers, retail customers, and then we don't cover job costing. Any questions? Yes. Um, 
How do you what, honey? A statement. You would want to do a statement. <clears throat> We're going to look at that Wednesday night, but that's okay. If you look at the home page, you'll see statements. You should see statements. See right there? All right, so vendors, pretty much the same. I had already set up this Ohio Department of Tax. Now we're asking about the 1099. See that tax settings? Go in there, give their social number, and mark them. Now it's going to track it. It'll track everything you paid this year. All right? Yes? I'm sorry, customers, is there a way to assign customer numbers? No. Any other question? Yes. Can you, can you manually? Yeah, you can manually enter them. She said assign them. I know. I know. Yeah, you know, you'd have to manually put it in there. Here's what I always want you. Oh, I put on the tax number. Do you see? She wanted to know how to turn a vendor, a 1099, track a 1099. Under the vendor account, it's under tax settings. And that's where you would mark it and put their social number in. Just so you know, guys, doesn't matter how an a, attorney operates, we always have to get a 1099. Guess the government does not trust us. Right? Yes? If you're subcontracting to another business, uh -huh. like LLC, is it the EIN number or the... It's the EIN number, okay. and it's only if it's a single member LLC. Say that again? It's the EIN number, and if it's a single member LLC, you use the EIN number if it's a, a LLC, not their social number. You said not to store the social numbers, or just I'm just saying be cautious if you're doing that. I don't store them, <clears throat> but be cautious. Make sure you have everything locked down. If you don't have the so no, if you don't have that in there, it won't do your reporting. And if you don't have the credit cards in there, you can't use Intuit's online payment. I use Square, but it won't use her online. But my clients will go, I want to pay my invoice. Do you have a credit card from last time? I go, no. That was shredded. <laughs> I don't want to keep their stuff. All right, there's one less thing I don't have to keep. Under account settings on the vendor page, this is where you can set default general ledger accounts. And we're going to see that Wednesday night. As we enter data, it will automatically pick up. Say it's uh, Office Max. And every time you buy from Office Max, it goes to Office Supplies. We'll put the account in here and it will default to that. But always pay attention because if you buy something that's $2,500 or more, it has to go to a fixed asset. If you're doing your tax return yourself, I don't recommend it, but if you are, you can now, as a small business, make an election. It's called the de minimis election. It's an election you make every year on your tax return so that anything you buy that's $2,500 or less, expense it. You do not have to depreciate it. All right? It makes life a lot easier, doesn't it? But you have to make that election every year on your return. It's a statement that's made. That's why I say use a tax preparer. Yes? Yeah. And when I say over 2500 it doesn't mean here's my invoice. I bought five items and it's 2700 Okay? Yes? What? There's an, there could be an audit issue if you didn't file the election. It's an election that's made at the time of filing your return. If your return gets audited, they can say you didn't make the election, so you should have capitalized it and depreciated it. And then I would argue, well, okay, then I would have Section 179 it. But, you know. So what's the Section 179? That's where you write it all off if you have income to, to write it all off. But, you know, you want to make sure, and that's why I say use a tax preparer. You're in a business. It's not always simple now. It's not like your W-2s. All 
items. Items are a whole different beast. And we're going to talk about inventory a lot on Wednesday night. Review 38, which tells you the various different kinds of items. I always like to call it inventory, but it's not always inventory. If you see on page 38, an inventory part is the only thing that is tracked, that tracks the quantities and the cost. It's the only thing that will record inventory on your balance sheet. So if you are selling inventory, things you buy and later resell, you want to make sure you use an inventory part for that item. Non-inventory part, let's say I'm a landscaper, I go buy some arborvitaes, and I want to bill them to the customer, I do a non-inventory part just so I know the cost and I can place it on their invoice. Service, self-explanatory. All right, so we'll go through these really thoroughly, um, but you can look at this till you come back on Wednesday when we start Lesson 3, the sales cycle. Any questions? System overload? Sorry. All right, do you have like some surveys that have to go out? Thank you, everybody. Thanks.